I hope after seeing this for three weeks, you're figuring out the book of Acts. Hopefully, uh, you'll, you'll ca- catch this. So we started a brand new series uh, about three weeks ago, and we're, we're, we're at the tail end of it. But I just want to start off by saying happy Thanksgiving to you. For those of you that I didn't see uh, here on Thursday, we had a full house. It was fun, uh, just worshiping. And uh, today, uh, we've been... Uh, we're going to take a look at this whole topic of beyond the walls, but in the area of, 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 of really changing your plans. And I'm laughing because this chair is always on that side, and I'm always preaching on that side. So I, I think God has a sense of humor here today. I was just going to change the chair back over there, but I thought, no, we'll go with it. So I'm modeling, um, you know, when you have one plan to do one thing, and there you go. So uh, here we are uh, this morning, and I, I have a really deep theological question to start off with. It's this. Are you ready? Are you, you got the thinking brain going here? Coffee's kicked in. Um, do we have, and be loud and proud about this, do we have any type A people here today? Okay. I, now I know you weren't ready for me to ask that question, so some of you are really struggling with that because, you know, usually you are very uh, planned out, right? Uh, do we have any just spontaneous kind of people out there? Okay, yeah, those are usually going to be at the five o'clock service because they just woke up this morning and decided they were going to go to the beach or something, you know? Uh, but but, but uh, we, 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 we have this, uh, this, this dislike uh, to different degrees, each of us, with uh, 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 being planned out. And some of us are way over here and we're type A and then the others are just, you know, just fly by the seat of our pants kind of people. But I, I would say that there's probably a happy medium where, where most of us don't like when we're driving and we see that big yellow sign that says what? Detour. That was a type A person that just said that. <laughs> I, I'm just gonna, I'm just gonna, I have to give a public service announcement for you type A people. This is gonna be like fingernails on a scratch, on a, on a, on a, on a chalkboard uh, message, but that's okay, you'll be able to handle it. But, but that, that, that detour sign, you know, when you have a plan to go one way and then there's this sign that says, no, uh, we're sending you another way. How many of you ever use uh, some kind of system on your phone to um, go somewhere with directions like Google Maps or something or Siri or something like that? Has there ever been a time that you've put in a destination and it said you will arrive in 52 minutes, but halfway through it, it changes and it reroutes you and it says you will be there now in an hour in 23 minutes all the time time. you must drive in LA so 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 here Thursday we had a wonderful worship service uh and it was great and then uh we were we we had my mother and father-in-law's minivan all packed up ready to go to my sister who lives just outside of San Francisco so it's Drew my son and his wife and then my younger son Easton my wife and my two in-laws pack the minivan. We get in there at 11.03. I'm going to be eating turkey near San Francisco at 5.30. That was my plan. (laughs) Actually, I should say 4.30. We got there at 5.30. But here's the deal. We get in the car, and the first thing is they look it up, and it says, man, we're going to get there in five hours and 22 minutes. I'm like, yes! And then we get on the 118, and we get to the 405, and that's where it gets a little nasty on Thanksgiving, but we made it right through. And all of a sudden, I'm like, man, we're going to get there. Gobble, gobble, gobble. And then Magic Mountain Parkway happened. Oh, you've been there? Like, I thought there was a major earthquake that happened there. I thought there was a 20-car pileup. There was pretty much nothing. It took us an hour and 10 minutes to get five miles from Magic Mountain to Castaic. Yeah, you feel my pain. My plans had been changed. I fly home last night and I land in Burbank and I realize um, I don't have a ride home. So, um, <laughs> little thing. The car's up there in San Francisco still with my family. So, so I Uber. Now, for 99% of you, that's a normal thing. For me, this is a big challenge. I've only Ubered twice in my life. Uh, I don't think I've ever Ubered by myself. So I'm sitting there and I'm like, what do you do? And I push the app and it's so confusing to this guy. Long story short, I end up getting in this car with church, this society has so confused us. This is not normal to jump in a car at night 
with somebody you have no clue who they are. <laughs> Let me just tell you that. And I'm sitting there going, this is, this is weird. And then we're going, I'm like, okay, we're on the, the five. And I'm like, okay, we're gonna. And then all of a sudden he goes, oh, you're lucky day. We're gonna pick up somebody else. That means your rate is cheaper. I don't see it going down cheaper on my phone, but we get off at Lankershire. Do I need to say anything else? I'm like, I'm being set up. And there's a button that says, you can tell your family where you're at and I'll keep pushing in it. It's not working. And I'm like, I'm done. Should I check John Stahlberger to say, you got to preach tomorrow because I'm dead. I'm the stupid guy. I'm not kidding. We're going through all these side streets off Lake or Shimlon going, this is the stupidest thing in the world. And we picked up the guy, which I have to be honest, was really sketchy. Can I just tell you, he's probably preaching at another church talking about. <laughs> but my plan was not to share this. And by the way, the ride was not cheaper. It just took me a lot longer to get home. Okay, now I feel better. We're going to look at the Bible today. Eventually. Change of plans. And we're going to see that as silly as Rob Denton's things are about change of plans, we're going to see a story in Acts chapter 9 that was a game changer. A game changer. Talk about plans being changed. Let's pray. Father, it is so good to be in your house. And thank you for just um, letting us laugh, letting us uh, just breathe letting us engage, letting us have a family that we could come and, 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 and interact with. And most importantly, thank you that uh, you're a God that desires us to come before your throne. God, this, this meal that I've prepared for, for today for us to, to eat and feast on is, is, is really um, just, just my effort. But God, I, I pray that you turn this meal into something that fills our stomach, that fills our hearts, and helps us to walk out of here more courageous than we've ever been, to be more excited about life than we ever have been. God, only you could do this through your Holy Spirit. We look forward to seeing what you're gonna do in each and every heart and each and every life. We love you. In the powerful name of Jesus and all God's people said. Amen. Acts chapter 9. If you need a Bible, raise your hand. These fine gentlemen are going to make their way down. Most of you have the Bible on your, um, your mobile phone, your mobile devices, if you want to turn there. Uh, we've, we've looked at Acts chapter 6, and we've looked at Acts chapter 7, Acts chapter 8. It's been an exciting picture of the church on fire, the very first church in the first century, moving forward after really um, soon after Jesus' uh, death, burial, and resurrection. And uh, we look at Acts chapter 9. And we're going to look at verse 1, and it says this. Meanwhile, Saul was still breathing out murderous threats against the Lord's disciples. He went to the high priest and asked him for letters to the synagogue in Damascus, so that if he found any there who belonged to the way whether men or women, he might have them as prisoners to Jerusalem. So we see in Acts chapter one, uh, Jesus is ascended into heaven. We see that the, the, the disciples that Jesus has invested in are a little scared, a little concerned. An angel of the Lord appears to them and says, don't worry, there's gonna be a, a comforter. There's gonna be the gift of the Holy Spirit. He's gonna help you. He's gonna give you strength. He's gonna give you direction. He's gonna help you do what you need to do. You need to be witnesses in Judea, Jerusalem, Samaria, and all the ends of the earth. And, and, then, and, then, and then I'll come back. But until then, you gotta go. And the church went and you see Acts chapter Two and Peter preaching a incredible message. 3,000 plus give their life to Jesus Christ. The church is on fire. And then you go Acts chapter four and you, you start to begin to see uh, the, the disciples and the, 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 uh, uh, the, the church coming together and it says that they were reading scripture together. They were praying together. They were breaking bread together. They were sharing everything that they had in common. And then we go to Acts chapter six and we see that the church is exploding so much and moving forward so fast that, that there need to be some delegation of leadership. And we saw that 
happen. And then we go to Acts chapter 7 and we see Stephen, uh, one of those that God delegated the authority. And he's going and doing what God wants him to do. And, and he's leading out that way. And then he gets uh, put to death for preaching the good news. And standing there, the Bible says that there was a guy by the name of Saul. And now you fast forward to Acts chapter 9 and it's that same Saul. And in Acts chapter 7, Saul was giving approval to Stephen's death. Saul, we're, we're taught, that is, is an is a influential leader. He's the Pharisee of all Pharisees. I believe he loved God. He loved the law. He, he wanted to, 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 to make sure that everyone followed it, including himself. No one ever deviated from this. But you have to put that against the backdrop of what's going on now with Jesus Christ. You see, the church is on fire and some of his colleagues are now giving their life to this Jesus. In his mind, this is absolutely wrong. This is heresy. And so this dynamic leader with, with all sorts of skill sets that, that are beyond anything I could ever imagine is gonna do something about this Christianity. And in, this, in this, this chapter right here that we just read, uh, the, you see the word the way. Did you see that in there? The, the, the people of the way. This is Christ's followers. This is another way of saying Christians. And so then you go to, you see Stephen's death and then you learn about Philip last week and we talked about Philip, right? Going from comfort to discomfort. And we see Philip going and preaching the word because the church scattered after Stephen's death. It's scattered, Persecution happened, the distribution happened, and then evangelism happened. Do you remember that? They went from comfort to discomfort. And so now here's Saul. I don't know if he had a, a lazy boy chair. Probably not, because he was so intense. But he would stay awake at night, I would imagine, thinking about how can I put this to an end? How can I stop this fire? How can I stop these people that are preaching the death, burial, and resurrection? This is false. This is heresy. This is wrong. This is crazy. And then we get to Acts chapter 9. That's why it says, Saul, verse 1, was still breathing out murderous threats against the Lord's disciples. Murderous threats, it says. He was uptight. So he went to the high priest. Now, if you're taking notes, write down Saul. And then right underneath it, write down his plan. And his plan was to stop Christianity. His plan was to go to the high priest. His plan was 150 miles away. He heard that in Damascus, there were Christians over there. And he had to get there 150 miles away. That's about a two week journey. But it didn't matter if it was two weeks, three weeks, a month, I think, for Saul. If he knew that he could stop this, he was gonna do whatever it took. And so he goes to the priest and he says, hey, I'm gonna go there, I need permission. And when I find these people, these men and women of the way, these Christians, these Christ followers, do I have permission to put them in prison? Yeah. This was Saul's plan literally to put Christianity to death. As I've shared before and with the theme of beyond the walls, really what he wanted to do is, is, is keep Christianity at least behind the walls of Jerusalem, at least contained right there while he took care of all these other places. If they could just stay right there, then he's gonna, he's gonna win. But he was in trouble because it was going everywhere. It was out of his control. His mind was not changed about Christianity. He was filled with hatred and hostility. <laughs> Saul was what you call a sharp man. John Stott, a Christian theologian, wrote this about Saul. He says, he was a beast wolf to sheep. He was a beast wolf to sheep. But... But, and you're going to hear that word, because when we talk about beyond the walls, I'm going to change the plans. There's always a but, right? <laughs> you get picked up at the Burbank Airport, and you're going to go home on the 5 to the 118, but 
No, we're going to take a little detour. Right? There's those butts in the world, and I mean the one T butts, that are life changing. Change of plans. Well, we go, from, we go from his plan to God's plan now. Are you ready for God's plan? Okay, so we, we, we pick up in verse three. As he neared Damascus on his journey, suddenly a light from heaven flashed around him. He fell to the ground and heard a voice say to him, Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? Who's speaking right here? Who's speaking right here? Jesus. Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? What is your problem? Then listen to verse five. Who are you, Lord? Saul asked. Check this out, check this out. I am who? That sounded really good. I am Jesus, whom you're persecuting. He replied, now get up and go into the city and you will be told what? You will be told what you must do. Now church, this guy was wound tight. Saul was wound tight. And before we pick on him, let's bring this into our world. For those of you that are Christ followers that would say that you are a Christian today, if someone came in and, and started preaching another gospel, started saying that, no, Jesus is not the way, and started, you know, you fill in the blanks with whatever, it's, I think you'd be a little uptight too, wouldn't you? I hope you would be. That you would want to be passionate about keeping that truth. So I don't blame Saul. He's just, he's, he's passionate of what, if, what he believes is true. Now he's taken it to extremes and he was wrong. And that's why we have to be careful, don't we? We have to be careful. But, but here's Saul, that, that his plans are interrupted by who? God's plans. This is, this is a change of plans moment 101. Would you agree? See, God stepped in on this one big time. This guy was gonna go and he was gonna round up all the Christians in Damascus and he was gonna imprison them. But really, what we really understand about Paul or Saul is he was gonna have them put to death. That was his plan. But God said, not on my watch. He said, Saul, you might have your plan, but I'm bigger than your plan. And by the way, he's bigger than our plan too, today. And he said, Saul, why are you doing this to me? And Saul recognized him immediately, he says, Lord, right? There's a whole nother sermon right there. And God says, Saul, we're gonna do something different here. Because by the way, he didn't say that in here. I'm just interjecting this. Matthew chapter 16, when he's talking to Peter, he looks at Peter. Do you remember this? He looks at Peter and he says, upon this rock, I will build my what? I will build my church and the gates of Hades or the gates of hell will what? Will not prevail. Upon this rock, I'll build my church, right? Upon this rock, I'll build my church. And I want to tell you, just like I told Peter, the gates of hell are not going to win out. And Saul, I know your heart, and I know what you want to do, and I know what your plans are, and it's not going to happen. The gates of hell will not prevail. And the church was on fire, and the church was pressing forward, and God changed Saul's plans. Well, at least he gave him an opportunity. And I think that's really key in this message right here. As you look again at Acts chapter nine in verse four or verse, verse five, who are you, Lord? Uh, who are you, Lord? Saul asked. I am Jesus whom you're persecuting. Now get up and go into the city and you will be told what you must do. 
Church, I want to hang my hat here real quick, and then we're going to come back to this uh, full circle later in the message. But I think it's so important that we, keep, we, we, we recognize this, that this was a choice that God gave Saul. He zapped him on the road. That was cool. I went like that, and then the lights. Wow. Wow. Change of plan. He zapped him on the road. But it doesn't say an angel picked him up and brought him to Damascus and made him dot, dot, dot. He stopped him. And then he said, Saul, you got a choice. You could keep doing your will or you could do mine. And church, as you fast forward to 2018, the same truth is today. I know there's other churches out there that have different theologies on it, but can I just be as bold and arrogant to say, but my theology comes from here. And I believe that God gave us free will. And with that free will, we have responsibility. And with that responsibility, we could choose to do what we want to do or what God wants to do. And this is the choice that Saul is given here. Now, let's read on. Then the men, verse seven, then the men traveling with Saul stood there speechless. They heard the sound but did not see anyone. Saul got up from the ground, but when he opened his eyes, he could see nothing. So they led him by the hand into Damascus. And for three days he was blind and did not eat or drink anything. Church, how are you when you're left alone with your own thoughts for 20 minutes? for half of a day, for a full day. I don't know about you, but it gets gets really weird up here. And then you don't have any food, and you don't have any drink, and probably very little sleep. And he went three days being left with his own mind and no sight. But I wanna suggest in those three days, He really wrestled with this idea, am I gonna do what I want or am I gonna do what God wants? Would you agree? Again, we're gonna come back to this for our own lives. But we're gonna see what his decision was. But before that, we're gonna be introduced to another person. Acts chapter nine, verse 10. In Damascus, there was a disciple named what? Named who? Ananias. The Lord called him in a vision. Ananias? Yes, Lord, he said. The Lord told him, go to the house of Judas on Straight Street. Isn't that funny? They named streets back then. And ask for a man, and ask for a man from Tarsus named Saul for his praying. In a vision, he has seen a man named Ananias come and place his hands on him to restore his sight. (laughs) Check this out, verse 13. Lord, Ananias answered, I have heard many reports about this man and all the harm he has done to your holy people in Jerusalem. As if you didn't know. And he has come here with authority from the chief priest to arrest all who call on your name. And I could just see God going, oh my goodness, thank you, Ananias. I had no idea. Oh my gosh, you just saved the whole situation. No, God knew exactly what he was doing. And here we have another man. His name is Ananias. And his plan was, no, I'm just gonna keep doing what I do well. And I'm gonna go hang out with my family and I'm gonna eat and I'm gonna, you know, I don't know if he was a, cra- a wood craftsman or, or if he worked on a farm or whatever it was, but he, that was his plan. And then when God said, no, you're gonna go and you're gonna meet this guy named Saul that's blind and he has this vision and you're gonna lay hands on him. Ananias' plan was no way, no way, right? 
His plan was, no way, I'm not going to do that. Because what you don't know, God, is he's a crazy man. And he's out there to destroy your church, and he's out there to, 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 to destroy me and my family. That was Ananias' plan. But God's plan was what? Different. And check this out. <laughs> Verse 15. But the Lord said to Ananias, Go, this man is my chosen instrument to proclaim my name to the Gentiles and their kings and to the people of Israel. I will show him how much he must suffer for my name. Verse 17. Then Ananias went to the house and entered it. Can we, can we pause here for a second? You remember how Saul had a choice on the road to Damascus when he was blind, whether he was just gonna keep doing his plan or God's plan? Ananias had the same crossroad. The same God that spoke to Saul was the same God that spoke to Ananias, and he said, Ananias, I have a plan for you. I know it's different than your plan, but I need you to go do this. But you know what? Ananias could have said no. Right, church? He could have said no. But then you look at verse 17. Then Ananias went to the house and entered it. Placing his hands on Saul, he said, Brother Saul, the Lord Jesus, whom has appeared to you on the road uh, as you are, were coming, has sent me so that you may see again and be filled with the Holy Spirit. Immediately something like scales fell from Saul's eyes and he could see again. He got up and he was baptized. And after take, taking some food, he re regained his strength. Now church, this is an awesome story where we can spend many many weeks on this but for today's purposes if we want to go beyond the blo uh, the walls not just like last week we need to walk from comfort to discomfort we also need to go from our plan to his plan did you hear that I, I, if we're going to go beyond the walls we have to go from our plan to his plan and I'm not gonna say that our plan's all the way over here and God's plan's over there. Sometimes they're right there next to each other, but sometimes it is as radical as a Saul conversion where he's, he's fighting for this team and then the next thing you know, he's fighting for the winning team. But again, there was choice involved. And for Ananias, the same thing. He could have said, God, no, I'm not gonna put my life at risk. I'm not gonna put my family's life at risk. I'm not gonna put my fellow uh, church members at risk. God, I, I must have just had some bad Chinese food tonight. This is probably not your voice that I'm hearing. And I'm just gonna keep going with what I know is right. But he didn't. And he stepped out of comfort into discomfort. And you know what? I think Ananias might be one of the most under-recognized heroes in all of Scripture. Why? Outside of Jesus Christ himself, I don't think there's one person that made a greater impact on Christianity than who we know today now as Paul. Right? Not only did, did, did Saul have a change of heart, he had a change of name. He went from Saul to Paul. And he wrote most of, of, of what we know, the New Testament after the Gospels. You read Corinthians, and you, you see all the craziness that, that Paul did for Christianity. But who was the little guy in the background in obedience that said yes to God? It was who? Ananias. Now, let's transition to the last point of the sermon. We've looked at Saul, Paul, going from his will to God's will. Ananias going from his will to God's will. Now, what about us? What about us? I get to be a little bit personal here now, and some of you know my story, some of you don't. I will never talk uh, tire of telling my story because the truth is it's his story. It's his story. So Rob Denton grew up, not a Christian, 18 years old, graduated high school actually at 17. Then I, I, I enrolled at um, Fullerton Junior College. And there I tried out for the tennis team. I'm on the tennis team. I enrolled in the, the sports broadcasting. Uh, that, that's what I was going to do. So I was going to start to take classes for that. 
Uh, meanwhile, I get a call from my mom who lives here in the valley. I'm out in Orange County, lives here in the valley with my sister uh, who just landed a, a, another really good movie. She needed a set sitter. I'm now 18 years old and I get to uh, set sit and make some money. So I come down here and I do all that and then some of you guys know um, my big thing was I had many opportunities to say yes to Jesus Christ, but I didn't. I could tell you, I could tell you four specific situations. Uh, especially in high school with my um, wrestling coach who really pressed me with the gospel. But I didn't have time for it. Long story short, traveling back at one o'clock in the morning from Orange County to here, I fell asleep on the 134. I should have Ubered, um, but they didn't have Uber back then. Went across all the lanes going 70 miles per hour, went through a fence, went down a little hill that's over there still towards the LA River. Car totally smashed. I wake up and you know I'm tuna in a tuna can um, for me that's my road to Damascus not everybody has to have a road to Damascus as a matter of fact for those of you that knew Christ at the very young age of you know six, seven, eight, nine years old and you're still walking with the Lord I think that's one of the most powerful testimonies out there Never underestimate your testimony. Don't think like you have to have drugs, sex, and rock and roll in your testimony in order for it to be great. If you dedicated your life at, for your whole life to Christianity, you're a hero <laughs> of mine. So that was my road to Damascus. I mean, literally, um, God zapped me right there. So I had a choice. I had a choice. The next morning when I talked to my sister, who's 16 years old, a Christ follower that was going to this church, at the time in this school. I said, Christine, tell me about this God. You know what my other option was? I'm 18 years old and invincible. Nothing could stop me. Not even going 70 miles per hour sleeping. But I had an opportunity to listen to the Lord. And you know what I started reading? This. And I read, started reading specifically the book of John. And I learned of a, lo, a, 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 a God that loved me immensely. And I learned of a God that had grace for my life. Can any of you relate to that? And it changed me. On April 26, I, I, I said yes to Jesus in uh, 1987. My plan was to be a sports broadcaster. God had a different plan. And then I became a Christian and started doing the college ministry. Had a blast with that with a lot of people that are here today. <laughs> Back then weren't married and weren't old. Um, <laughs> they got old and I stayed the same. But then I started working uh, on PCH. My view was of the ocean right off of Topanga, uh, kind of right there by Duke's restaurant in second story and I looked right in the ocean. And a very successful uh, State Farm uh, insurance agent, um, Darvin Howe, uh, took me under his wings and he was grooming me to become an agent. And maybe even one day take over his, um, his business right there, which I'm sure had a lot of claims here in the last week. Um, that was my plan. But then a youth pastor took me out to dinner it was late at night at Bob's Big Boy on Sherman Way. Does anyone remember Bob's Big Boy on Sherman Way? And I'll never forget as Darren Skates looked across that table and he says, Robbie, I think you need to go into full-time ministry. And I said, I think you need to order another milkshake because <laughs> you're smoking dope. I, I, I kid you not, being a pastor was not even close to something I ever dreamt about or ever even wanted. But my plans are different than his plans. And I'm very grateful for that man that invested that time in my life and risked calling me to do something. Walking from comfort to discomfort. And many of you in this congregation were a part of seeing this little Robbie grow into Pastor Rob. The name change.
Is the change that God is calling for you in your life to go from where you are to become a pastor? No. But what is it? What is it that God has for your life? Are you in the midst of it right now? Are you living it? Praise God. Stay there. But if it's about living your will and not doing his will, I would challenge you, and more importantly, the Lord God Almighty would challenge you to listen and to choose. Now, that's a whole nother sermon. What's his will? How do we know it? Can I make it really simple? Can I give you the Cliff Note 101? It's in Matthew chapter 22. When Jesus is asked, what is the greatest commandment? And Jesus says, love the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength, and love your neighbor as yourself. We say it this way at West Valley. The reason our church exists is to help people love God and love others. By the way, that ought to be the mission statement for each and every one of our lives individually. How do you know if you're doing God's will? If what you are doing with your life is drawing you closer to the Lord, in helping you love other people, I think you're sitting right there. Now again, I'm gonna fly in the face of some theologians and some theology that's out there of other churches, and that's okay because I'm right. <laughs> but I don't think God has it all detailed and mapped out. He can. But I think what God's ultimate desire is, like me as a father, my son happens to be a fireman. But if he chose to be a manager at Taco Bell, but he was able to be a respectful citizen of the United States that contributed, and he loved God, then that's what matters. Amen. Drew could have done anything he wanted, but as long as the big picture was being taken care of, all the little details didn't matter. I share that because I wrestled really hard. When I, uh, when I finished Bible college, I had to do an internship and I went to New Zealand. I go to New Zealand and, um, for three months and the last week before I left, the elders called for a meeting at one of the elders' house. I should have known this was weird because the other pastor wasn't there that poured into me. And they sat there and said, Robbie, we want you to be our pastor. Now think that through a little bit. <laughs> That's not good. Um, because the guy that had poured into me all summer was the guy that they wanted to get rid of. And I came back here, and Lisa and I were newly married. We had no kids, and I said, Lisa, would you be willing to move to New Zealand? And she said, if that's what God wants us to do, well, let's do it. And so, but I'm like, but, but West Valley's offering me a full-time job too. At that point, I'd only been an intern. And I, I wrestled so hard, and there was another opportunity in Colorado at that time. I wrestled with it so hard because I was young in my faith and I thought, oh my gosh, is it door number one, door number two, or door number three that God wants me to choose? I was playing let's make a deal with God. <laughs> and one of our associate pastors at that time, Tom Moyers, took me to a restaurant which is right now, uh, right here, Weiler's. It's, it wasn't Weiler's back then, I think it was Tondo's. And I told him of my struggle and he looked at me and he said this. He says, Rob, it's not a right and wrong decision, it's a better and best decision. And I want to say that again to you here today also as we are dealing with my plan and his plan as you are seeing things there are a lot of good things that God might be leading you to and I want to tell you this I don't think there's a right and wrong and as long as you are going to be glorifying him and loving people there might be a better and best so if I said yes to New Zealand I think God would have used me there if I said yes to Colorado I think God would have used me there and yet I said yes to us, Val, and I think he might have used me here. Does that make sense? What is God calling you to do? Wrestle with that. Chew on it. Figure out what that is through reading his word, praying, and talking to godly people. It's not too late. And if you're in it, Keep doing it.